cloud. Welcome everyone. This is another fireside chat. Um, and today you will be hearing from a group of uh, researchers and members of our research infrastructure as, at large. Um, I'm Malvi Kashan, I'm a co-lead of the Turing Way. Uh, the Turing Way is an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook on data science. Our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. We represent an international community of researchers who create resources as chapters and community practices, bringing perspectives from their countries and backgrounds. This fireside chat series is an effort towards creating a space where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share practices that work in different contexts. Today, uh, we are very delighted to co-host this discussion with Rhea El Zain from Code for Science and Society, who will introduce herself in a moment. Please note that we have a shared etherpad to facilitate written note taking and invite your ideas. Um, you can take this back with you. We will not delete it, but chances are in three months, it will be archived. Um, we have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration throughout. For any concerns or reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call or any further idea to improve accessibility in the Turing Way, please email the turingway at gmail.com. You can directly reach out to our code of conduct facilitator, Anne, who is a co-moderator of the session or me um, by email, and we will add our email in the etherpad as well. With that, I'm delighted to hand it over to Anne to kick off today's session by introducing herself, the topic, and our speakers. Cool. Thanks so much, Malvika. Um, I'm Anne, a community manager of the Turing Way. I'm going to drop the link to the notes doc um, here again, where you can add your information on line 44. And by community manager, I mean that I'm a part of and help to steward both an organizing team and a community of people that steward contributions to the book and the community, our community led guides, but also the many other projects kind of surrounding that work. And I'm really honored to bring together a couple of folks together here to discuss this question. It's a very, very big question of what is open infrastructure anyways, um, to kind of get back to first principles and to discuss what it means in different contexts. Because if there's anything that I've learned about being a relative newcomer to open science and open research, but having studied open source communities as an ethnographer and worked with open data as a journalist, it's that open infrastructure means so many different things to so many different people, despite the fact that it's used really widely and really broadly. And so I'll give an example here from the Turing Way. You know, we have open infrastructure used as a means of um, means of describing, you know, what enables open computation through um, open computational environments, through open source software. Um, but also we're talking about the publishing infrastructure, about code infrastructure. Um, we have not only that, but also the people that enable these computational environments, um, which are called open infrastructure roles is the term that's emerged to describe them. And we'll flag here that there was a fireside chat recently back in April that talked a little bit through what that means. Um, if someone wants to maybe drop that link in the chat. Um, but of course, when I'm talking about these definitions that are social and technical, right, this binary is, is quite artificial. Um, Socio-technical definitions of infrastructure, at least within the Turing way, are very much embedded within the project. But um, if there's anything I've learned from speaking to people both within this community and within the wider ecosystem, it's that you know we're talking about very precarious processes and, and oftentimes quite invisible processes. And even going beyond, you know, our part of the ecosystem into the wider ecosystem at large that works with openness. Um, open infrastructure takes on many different meanings outside of that too, outside of that as well. And so this fireside chat was really just meant to gather together a group of people to kind of work that work in and around research environments in different ways, or even outside of them, to kind of get back to these first principles, as I was saying. Um, and they come from really different backgrounds and, and skills, with that being said. Um, and of course, we won't get to a collective definition by the end of this call, it's too much to ask over the course of an hour and a half, but hopefully we'll get a little bit closer to talking through the differences, um, the context, you know, what, what are we actually talking about when we talk about open infrastructure? Um, 
really honored to have worked with Raya, uh, with Raya Elzine um, from Code for Science and Society to develop this conversation. Um, it was really through conversations with her that you know the aims of, of our conversation today really uh, were shaped and took place. And you know, we'll see where this goes. Uh, so back to logistics, we will start with a round of introductions. Uh, well, everyone will introduce themselves first um, and kind of start with the, you know, uh, introducing yourself, you know, who you're talking about, who you're representing, but also begin with this initial question of how do you support open infrastructure through your work? And maybe, you know, the definitions that will emerge out of that will be quite implicit. So I'll start by passing it on to Rhea first. Super. Thank you, Anne. Um, I want to start with some thanks. Uh, many thanks to Malvika, who's been a, a curious and eager partner and interlocutor since I joined CSNS a few years ago or a year a year and a half ago. Um, and I want to thank Anne also, who has done more than the lion's share of facilitating and planning for today. Um, thanks for your patience with me and your curiosity in putting this together. I'm really happy to be here with all of you and very eager to hear from Sarah and Lillian and Richard how they're thinking about the questions that Anne has just outlined. Um, so I'll jump into my intro. Uh, I'm a person who's curious about how change happens. I was a graduate student when the Arab uprising started and those deeply moving events were really cataclysmic in shaping my adult and my professional interests. In almost every community that I've been a part of, politics is something that people treat with suspicion. And yet it, we're all a part of the very real political and social changes that are making this a very turbulent period of public history. So my work, whether that's been among artists or among technologists or among scientists has been about trying to understand why people make the decisions they do at a given moment. How can we explain why people show up protests on this day, but not on this day any other year? Why do they prioritize comfort or care at another? Um, how can we better understand apathy and burnout as very pregnant periods of change um, or as very uh, potent behaviors themselves? Um, these kinds of questions. As an academic, I was permitted to ask these things kind of abstractly, um, but I'm much more interested in following up on these bigger questions to ask um, based on this kind of understanding of human choices and decisions, how can we affect change in specific sectors and specifically uh, regarding digital technology and education, those zones of promise, I think, that touch and potentially uh, connect us all together. I'm trained as a humanist and as a social scientist, not as an engineer. So I approach technology as a human dynamic. It's thread through for me with questions of culture, of politics, of ideology. I don't believe that tools by themselves affect change very well. I think that meaningful change requires a lot of people to change their minds, to shift their behaviors, to adjust their practices. And that takes time, but it also takes attention to dynamics across sectors, between societies, it needs an interdisciplinary uh, and holistic understanding. At CSNS, Code for Science and Society, where I work, I was brought on to pilot the Digital Infrastructure Incubator, which is a cohort-based capacity building program that one of its reasons for existing is to ask why meaningful change around sustainability and equity in open infrastructure is happening so slowly. And it probes what we as capacity builders, as social scientists in the open ecosystem can do about that. Uh, in the incubator, we work with teams developing their project governance uh, or designs for community engagement or plans for localization, these kinds of things. At CSNS more broadly, we're focused on advancing the power of data to improve lives. And we do that through infrastructural support for open projects, open science, open data, and open infrastructure projects. So when we think about infrastructure at CSNS, like what, what we're doing, that might mean solid operations in the fiscal sponsorship program. It might be in building community-led funding in the event fund. It might be training and support around questions of sustainability and equity like we do in the incubator. Uh, How's that, Dan? <laughs> that's what I've got. Um, that's where I'm coming from, and I'm really eager uh, to hear from the others. I love that turn of phrase, zones of promise. Um, 
And with that, I'm going to pass it on to, to Sarah next. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Gibson. Um, I'm currently working as an open source infrastructure engineer at 2I2C, the International Interactive Computing Collaboration. And we are actually um, incubated, fiscally sponsored by Code for Science and Society as well. So very, thank you very much for that. Um, what we do at 2I2C is we try and provide the computational infrastructure to research groups and education groups using an open source stack in a way that is sort of um, in terms of like power dynamics, the people using that infrastructure can still be involved. And we also contribute what we develop back upstream to the open source stack we depend on. So my approach to infrastructure is probably the very typical, traditional, it's like the stuff you need to get done. But I think importantly, we have this um, other aspect of bringing in the people who are using that infrastructure as well, because what is interactive computing? It's that interface between the person and the computer that you're doing research on, educating on. And it's very important that that system works well for them. And the reason why I think it's important that we provide this service is that for so long in these kind of groups where they want to do open science and they care about doing open science like all the way down the stack, the levels of tech um, skills and knowledge don't necessarily overlap with the interest and in, or core competencies of the people who want to do it. And so this is about knowledge sharing and like providing a service to unburden researchers in so that they can excel in their domain as well. Um, so I approach open infrastructure by building it with the people who are using it. I think that's me. And from the perspective of the, of the builder um, on the ground and I think with that, I'll pass it on next to uh, Lillian. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Lillian from Uganda, East Africa. Yeah, um, I'm working with Access Plus. And Access Plus, what we are doing is uh, extending uh, what we call community-owned telecommunications infrastructure to address connectivity and uh, needs uh, of the communities. So right now, we uh, the center that we've established is at uh, in one of the rural communities in northeastern Uganda, that is the Soroti district, and it happens to be um, the first public ICT service center uh, in 57 villages. And uh, unlike about a few months ago, unlike two months ago when they had to travel about 30 kilometers to access ICT services, uh, we've extended it to within the community. Yes, and so um, my understanding of, um, of, of, of open infrastructure is more to do with uh, the physical infrastructure and then the, uh, the physical telecom infrastructure that is the devices and all that and then the content and then software that uh, has to be um, usable across uh, different community networks across Africa irrespective irrespective of the community 
Yes, so uh, that is that is uh, just a nutshell of, of what I understand about uh, open infrastructure. Basically, uh, to me, it means anyone should be able to connect to anyone in a technology neutral framework that encourages low cost delivery of services to the users. And so it's more about uh, universal access. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Lillian. Uh, there were some really uh, interesting and, and very overlapping questions emerging here around software and hardware, about interoperability, about what it means to work with communities emerging from what you said, from what Sarah said, from what Raya said. Um, wonderful to have Max here also as a co-host of this little cat. And uh, to close off our round of introductions, I'll pass it on to Richard. Hello, uh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm the director of research and strategy at Invest in Open Infrastructure, um, part of the, uh, the, the very strong uh, Code for Science and Society family that's being represented here. Um, and so we, you know, our focus within this is in our name, right, investment, um, but we understand it very broadly and not just direct funding, but also creating the conditions uh, for which these services, these tools and technologies uh, can really prosper and be sustainable. So what does it mean um, for these technologies to become the default in research? That's really our focus. Um, so we are focused on the, the, the funders um, and, and how they can be good players, good actors in this space, helping coordinate funding, be more strategic and thoughtful. Um, but that's also really coordinating with the providers as well. Like, what do you need? And what, what, what would make your services more sustainable? And then working with the community as well, because it is all in partnership. Um, I, I do believe firmly that the, the, the promise of openness is only realized, whether it's open source software or open infrastructure or whatever, is only realized when it's embedded in community. And too often community gets neglected because it's not something you can code. It's not something you can write a policy paper about. Like it, it takes a lot of work and cultivation um, to be able to create. And when it comes to um, calling something open infrastructure, Lillian, you have great comments there. I think it's it's very important to be very open. It is not just in, oh, we have an open source repository or something like that, but how you include others into this, the community that you engage with um, for broad, diverse kind of engagement at all levels of the organization. We just released a, um, a literature review on governance and what it means. We're following it up with more work on this idea of governance. Um, I'm, I spend a lot of my time in the about tabs for services to understand on their websites understanding how are things structured, how are things put together, where's the community involved in this, how is it run, how is it financed, and a lot of those kinds of questions, they really get to how do we make this open technologies, open infrastructure tools that enable critical research, that enable science and scholarly communication to happen, uh, for the knowledge to be treated as a, a public good and spread around the world to all those who need it, make that viable and sustainable now and into the long term. So I think I hit all the points for the introductions uh, for our organizations. So thank you so much. Um, wonderful. So with this in mind, I think now that we've talked a little bit about what, you know, what supporting infrastructure looks like in our respective contexts, whether it's on organizational and strategy levels, whether it's on the ground, working with folks building community networks, whether it's working with um, universities um, in real time to build computational environments, let's actually take a step maybe um, a step back and ask in a really much more general way, um, what are the goals of this open infrastructure that we're talking about? Um, because it is taking different nuances depending on all of us, right? And where we sit, whether it's at, you know, in many ways, an organizational level, a grassroots level, within open science, with, outside of open science, um, within hardware or software. And so, Really, the first question I think I'll ask is, you know, what is the goal of this open infrastructure and what is it making possible? Um, but I'll pass that on to, to Raya first. Raya, apologies. Thanks, Anne. Um, so I think there are different different goals for open infrastructure, and it's really important to probe and, and to ask this question. When Anne first approached me about a discussion that pursued 
like what what uh, definitions of open infrastructure might be, I wondered if it was possible to come to any kind of conclusion at all, considering the very different uh, players that have a stake in defining what open infrastructure is. I was thinking about the work of some of you here, but also about players that are in a in a field that is sometimes collapsed, but maybe it helps to think about them separately the field of digital public infrastructure, people who are thinking about things like digital IDs, digital public goods, and so on, right? So far, there hasn't been like a clear distinction. These could all be open infrastructure, or they could not, right? So when I hear like, what are the goals of open infrastructure, um, like in the icebreaker that um, you both have set out for us, I want to ask like, well, who's asking? Who wants to know, right? Um, one of the things we did in the incubator was actually to trace the discourse around infrastructure, right? To see if we as different projects in the incubator were feeling interpolated or were feeling called in by different aspects of this infrastructure. This is one thing that I like to share, right? Dating back like the use of infrastructure in English to um, the Second World War is thinking about military infrastructure, right? And then we see a progression over time. The infrastructure comes to me in bridges, roads, highways, um, and then into the digital age. Um, but I am sharing all that just to kind of step back a little bit from our positions here to trouble our relationship with the different discourses around infrastructure when do we call something infrastructure and when are we worried about infrastructure? Uh, and I would argue that usually we hear about infrastructure when we're worried about it in the common, um, in like the contemporary moment, right? So we're hearing a lot of uh, talk about infrastructure both in digital spaces and otherwise when the conversation is really about the precarity and vulnerability of different systems, whether that's like physical transport systems like roads and bridges or digital um, systems. Um, so that's maybe a sidestepping of the question, what are the goals? But that's how I'm thinking about uh, <clears throat> how do I understand the bigger picture uh, around open infrastructure? Then with that in mind, maybe we can switch then to ask from the perspective of people that are working with folks to build it in real time. And maybe I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Sarah first, ask what, you know, in your work with 2 i 2 c you know, what is the goal of open infrastructure with this kind of troubling of that definition in mind that Rhea brought in? Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think one role of open infrastructure is to provide an alternative that gives power back to the people who use it. Um, like you could sign up to one of the big three cloud platforms and get a service very similar to what to I2C offers and it will be fully managed. My cat just fell off the desk. Um, be fully managed it will be fully sorted for you but you as a customer won't have a lot of say in what resources might be set up you could pick from like a feature list but they're probably not going to develop something new for you and ultimately it, if they decide that they're not going to provide that service anymore they're not going to provide that service anymore. Um, we have something, we have a document at to ITC called the right to replicate, which gives our communities that we serve the right to take the configuration that deploys their infrastructure from one cloud provider to another cloud provider with or without our help. They have a say in where it's, um, in where it's deployed. They have a say in what feature set they get to some extent, um, depending on like engineer capacity. <laughs> and and um, we are also working on a document highlighting the right to participate, which is to help us build those things essentially um, as well. So yeah. Um, 
I think like that's one goal of open is to provide power back to the people who are using it and to make it an equal experience as well like one thing we say on the 2i2c website is to make it a delightful experience which i'm like half me is like how delightful is doing research <laughs> but another half of me is like yeah actually it should be really really cool to be able to very easily put all of these parts together and create a graph and everything and like that's just my bias no longer being a data scientist um <laughs> coming out so um yeah, I think that's our goal. And, and and Lillian, I know that you talked about, you know, open being usually defined, though, with with software in mind. Um, could you talk maybe a bit more about what it means to to build open hardware for community networks? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Anli. Yes, to to me, um, I'll just let me give a, a scenario of, of of what we really uh, experienced. That could, uh, yes, something that we experienced. One is we had to inst do installations um, of to deploy network infrastructure in this rural community. And then we had, in our technical survey, we actually identified um, existing fiber, we identified some infrastructure in place, you know, but then, um, but then first in order to even identify the owners of those that really erected erected such physical infrastructure in place it was very difficult for us to identify because there is uh, there is no open information there is no access to information as to who is really accessing that and yet to us it would have been a lot easier uh, if like it's quite easier for us to, to, to maximize what is already in place in order to build on it, given that we are a nonprofit, you know, and we, we are trying to minimize uh, costs. So it's about cost sharing. So we had a lot of such challenges and that's why we say um, items like, uh, the masks that are available, and then poles, utility poles, um, that could be access, you know, all that to us, it feels like uh, it should be, there should be some kind of criteria for some kind of guidelines or, or some documentation to allow cost sharing or not, it could be cost sharing at a affordable rate or at least sharing of that infrastructure. Then um, the other thing is that um, when we are building these community networks, for instance, we are using devices, but then these, these devices are really restricted. You cannot easily use another model on two a particular model of device that would have used. And that becomes a little bit expensive for us. And so all we are saying is let the devices, let the switches, the rotors be open in such a way that if another manufacturer can, a, another manufacturer's uh, switch can work in, in this existing switch, in this other switch, then that is already, you know, that is already open and, and, and it becomes less costly at the end of the day, given the kind of community that we are trying to work with. But, and then, um, yes, 
And then when it comes to the software bit of it, the software bit of it, you find that uh, community networks serve communities that are being left behind by the big telecommunication service providers. For one reason, they do such communities. And so for us, we are taking there the internet, we are taking their um, connectivity. And so, but then you find that for sustainability, there has to be something like for sustainability. And then we have to install certain things like, uh, like uh, the billing system. And now the billing system is a software when if made, if designed to, to, to really be replicable to different communities, then to us, that would really work. Yes, so including as well um, software that can allow content sharing offline i am in east africa or a community in that is that is what i have to share for the moment at first it it seems to be like we're talking about two completely different spaces right on one hand we're talking about what it means to enable computational research environments on the other hand we're talking about connectivity and what that looks like so it was interesting how bringing it back to what Rayo was saying in the sense that, you know, what is even defined as infrastructure? In many ways, these two worlds seem completely separate, right? Um, and they're asking very, very different questions. But if we're actually to ask, you know, what is EVE open infrastructure for? If it's for, you know, more access to knowledge, is it for the builder to visit for making the builders of that open infrastructure in both of these places to be more connected? Is it for, um, when we talk about things like knowledge equity, about access to knowledge, about you know the ability to, for people to have access to research, um, really with these two dialogues being so split between computation and connectivity, how are we supposed to connect between the two, right? Um, and so, I'll just add that in as a question, building off of what you both were saying, but actually this leads in many ways to the next question that we'd had that also draws upon something that Rhea said, which is, oh, Richard, I see your finger. Well, yeah, may, uh, before you move on to another question, may I answer yeah. or kind of cover of my thoughts on this question? Um, so I, I think it's really important to understand that infrastructure enables activities, right? And if we use a physical infrastructure example, right, roads allow us to travel. Not all roads are created equal. There are certain modes and methods of travel that are more important than others. And so I think it's very important to understand what is infrastructure, what is it enabling, and looking at what that activity is, particularly when we talk about um, what's critical infrastructure and what's less critical infrastructure. Um, it's really important to understand the enabling that's done and how important that function is. And also to be clear um, that just because, you know, like highways, yes, very critical but they're also very important small roads. Those are the only access points, say, for rural areas. And there are analogs in the scientific space, right, of services that are relatively small, but serve a very important purpose for a small for that community and are, in a sense, also critical and, and pieces of it. But I think there's then a necessary discernment that we need to make between, you know, what is infrastructure, what is a, a, a just a, a tool, and what is a feature when we're thinking about these services um you know, you know brought out some very important things like the tell the poles that carry the wires right and the the switching systems behind it those are very important those aren't just nice to have those are essential kinds of pieces um but what mobile phone you run on that network okay well it's you know it's important but it's not necessarily critical there's a lot of options for that kind of connectivity so while a lot of there's a lot of organization that it's it's good to be seen as infrastructure and important there needs to be, I think, some discernment as to, okay, where do you fall in this spectrum? And it's really, I think, what are you enabling and how critical is that which you enable to this overall enterprise? We're talking about scientific research, scholarly communication, you know, the sharing of knowledge. How important is it to that? What do you, that, what you're enabling in there? 
So I just offer that up as an understanding. When we talk about what is infrastructure and how do we think about it? It's kind of something that's important for me. Yeah, and to that point as well, like what to ITC is are doing as builders is we're not just providing computation environments. And in fact, we don't provide computation environments. One of the things we ask our communities to do is build their own computation environments and we provide them scaffolding to do that in a way that is compatible with the infrastructure we provide. But actually, a computational environment alone isn't enough to get science or research done. You need hardware to do it on. And that is something we already have by deploying a Jupyter Hub system. Like Jupyter Hub is a solution to connecting people to hardware where a Jupyter notebook is a useful interface. The other thing you need is data. And that, that's an act, um, a, con a connectivity point as well, and something that we at 2ITC are starting to um, think about as part of a service model as well, because, um, you know, as science advances, like, we're generating so much more data, like petabytes, to the point where it's not feasible to work on that data set anywhere else but in the cloud. And often in its raw format, you can't work with it straight away anyway. So I know that groups at um, the Pangea group have worked on something called Arco data, which is analysis ready cloud optimized. And through Pangea Forge, they're trying to, they're trying to like set up a pipeline where you can transform your data, your raw data into this Arco format and then put it in a storage bucket somewhere that you can then connect to a Jupyter instance that may or may not be managed by 2I2C and sort of like complete that connectivity circuit in order to do groundbreaking science and and like that's like the whole infrastructure network to like draw a parallel to telecommunication wires and poles and mobile phone networks oh absolutely and um, on many levels and it, and it does seem then to use the to use the, not only the metaphor, but the, in real time, you know, connectivity and physical infrastructure, roads and bridges, as Ray was saying, you know, but she pointed out how infrastructure is only really visible when it breaks. And these processes that we're making visible in real time that we're talking about in real time, they're only really visible to those who use it or even those who don't use it, but see it from the outside when it doesn't work. And so, um, that is the question that I have been here is, you know, what breakages are not visible and what's really not even perceived to be a breakage at all. Um, I'll pass this on to, to Richard first. Uh, Lillian, you were unmuted. Did you want to share or? Okay, I'm making sure you're frozen. Uh, the, the labor. Honestly, so much of this is done by volunteer labor that it's it's becomes very ubiquitous. You have someone that shows up and does the work, and that's really great until that person gets sick or finally gets so tired or, or can't do it anymore, or whatever. Um, that becomes a real challenge. It's, it's built the system that we have is built on a lot of volunteer labor that is feels very extractive to a lot of people. Uh, and for and a lot of people who are doing critical work that are feeling really burnt out, you know, and it's um, the pandemic, of course, has made things worse, but even before that, I think it was, we're really at a critical mass where, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate we really need to address it and find ways of compensating or in whatever way possible, making that labor component of it um, work much better to make these, these services survive and, and can be maintained to the, now and into the future. I'll pass it on to, to Lillian next, because um, I saw you were unmuted before, but we had a bit of a frozen screen. Um, yes. Can you hear us okay? Um, please, uh, I lost you. Please. No, of course. Um, the question was about how open infrastructure or infrastructure, as you well know, is only really visible when it breaks. 
And so for your work in developing telecommunication community networks, you know, what, what is, uh, what causes these breakages, you know, and what is not visible or considered one? What is not visible? Sorry, it's raining here. So oh, no. I'm really struggling. Oh, Lily, yes. it's proof raining in real time. Yeah. Proof in real time that without any sort without connectivity, nothing else is possible, right? I'm mm -hmm. what in your experience, what causes breakages in community infrastructure, network infrastructure? What causes breakages? Yeah, how does it break? For all of us that assume connectivity, what causes those breaks? Uh, yeah, um, one is um, the, the, the cost. I don't know whether I get you right, but to um, the cost, associated with uh, with the telecommunication infrastructure is is really quite high for a community network setting um remember remember community network uh, basically focuses on the last mile the last the least uh people that uh uh, uh, that are actually should I say forgotten, you know? So so it quite it becomes a bit uh, more costly, very expensive to 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 establish connectivity in such places uh, because uh, the devices are really very expensive, and uh, then the cost apart from the connectivity costs. It's also the internet, the, in, the cost of internet itself uh, is a bit um, very high. For instance, we are actually paying $68 per Mbps per month. And yet we are required to, 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 to purchase two Mbps. Uh, I, I, I may sound a bit too technical, but uh, in, in all, it's, I'm just trying to say that it becomes a bit difficult. Uh, and then uh, the technology is not yet so efficient. It's not yet so efficient uh, down there. And so you find connectivity itself is not that reliable. You know, apart from it being very expensive, it's not still reliable and so not very sustainable. Yeah. 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 With this in mind, and I also wonder to, um, Rhea, with your experience and with Code for Science and Society, the incubator, with these projects that kind of went across, you know, different organizations such as 2ITC or such as IOI or um, extending into many other works that are, you know, talking about hardware, talking about software that are, you know, all different types and kinds of infrastructure, you know, really curious how you think through this idea of it only being visible when it breaks and what causes those breakages. In your experience, I mean, I don't think um, uh, either technology or uh, community, or you know, there are a number of different ways we could, different terms we could use to describe some of these things. They all inherently have like pieces that work and pieces that break at different points, right? I think what I was trying to say about like the discourse around infrastructure is um, uh, is paying attention to those those points of breakage, right? Um, so when we talk about innovation, for example, 
we don't typically think or talk about things that don't work, right? When we think the discourses around innovation are all about you know, new things, new tools, new ideas, right? Uh, freshness, newness, etc. cetera. Uh, when we talk about community, there are different associations, et cetera. When we talk about infrastructure, the associations are often around maintenance um, and, uh, and sustainability, right? And these are important, I think, because we're, we're marking a point where recognition of some of those things um, that Richard and Lillian were talking about, disparities in access, but also burnout and labor, right? Uh, we're marking a point when we're talking about it as infrastructure where it's becoming it's becoming more apparent, right? That to an outside observer, that these things are, uh, they, need, they need more attention. Um, so, uh, does that answer your question about what causes breakage? I think what I'm trying to say is that the breakages are always there, right? But what we're seeing is more attention to those places where they're falling apart. Completely. Um, it's really, really important to bring forward. And I also want to flag um, that there are a conversation going on in the chat. And I encourage you all to look at one um, that talks through, you know, what is defined as critical or not infrastructure, um, visible for whom um, that Patricia brought to the fore. These are also really important questions as well. Um, and so, so oh, I have to, I think, go on to the next question here, which maybe, you know, with these questions that we're asking or with these definitions in mind, um, you know, what misconceptions exist about open infrastructure? Um, and we've kind of addressed this already in a way, in the sense that you know, we've talked about how they're defined in our respective spaces, how it's visible and invisible art requires labor, how it's not just technical, it's an entire suite of systems that enable um, and, and people and folks and labor that enable these systems that we call open infrastructure, which is itself a very flexible definition. But there are still misconceptions that we all see and experience in real time. Um, and I'm going to pass this question to Lillian of what misconceptions exist about open infrastructure. Yeah, um, that's just like I've mentioned uh, before. Um, I tend to hear a lot more about uh, people talking about open infrastructure to, to do more, to be more about uh, software, you know? to be more about data. But then to me, I think it's, it's an all round kind of thing, starting with the, the physical infrastructure and, uh, and physical devices. So, uh, so it, because of that, you find that researches and then funding, you know, researches are more to do with the uh, data, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and data and then software. But then I don't know how much research that is being done on hardware, but then not hardware focused in developed countries. Because we have to know that, um, the developed countries and, and, and the developing countries, taking an example of Uganda, in terms of technology, we are looking at a difference of about maybe 20 years difference in terms of technology. So when we are developing the manufacturers of such uh, devices, the manufacturers of hardware, who exactly do they consult? Do they consult the users of the developed countries? Do they factor in users of the developing countries? Because we have totally different, you know, scenarios. We have different scenarios, we have different needs. 
our needs in the communities are really, really basic. And so there is that um, assumption and focus, too much focus on open infrastructure, be data and uh, software and content, but we have to really focus also on the hardware bit. And then we have to pay attention to um, the rural communities in developing countries. We are not talking about rural communities in developed countries because the difference is really huge. So the rural communities in de developing countries, our needs are really different. And, 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 and so when we factor in that, then we shall then be able to come up with solutions that can, can support the really basic communities that are still so, so behind in terms of technology. Those that are really starting up. We actually have, I was training recently, uh, Lillian, we might have an issue with audio. Um, does anyone else have an issue with audio? Oh no. Hopefully we'll be able to get her back in a second. Okay. It sounds like she might have dropped off the call due to um, the storm, but hi, Lillian. Yeah, hi. Oh, you're back. The network is disconnecting me all the time here. Yeah? It's quite unstable because of uh, that, that, the weather as well. Yes, so um, that that is really my view on um, on what I think the focus is on. And to me, it's really high time we thought, we, we paid attention to all this. The hardware, the software, the different communities. Yeah, thank you. You can supplement. Sarah, I remember in our in the planning call we talked also too about how precarious, you know, the systems that you're working through with are as well, in the sense that, you know, I'm finding it really difficult within our conversation collectively to be able to kind of connect together on one hand these like very, very foundational questions of connectivity and what it means to kind of, you know put us on more of a baseline to be able to have access to knowledge in the first place. But then the more that I've learned from, from folks like um, you all from the world of open science, the more I've also learned how precarious these environments are for building open source software, for building you know, computational environments in the cloud that requires hardware and software and personnel and funding and all of these things. And so, I think without maybe being able to respond properly to what Lillian is saying, I did want to ask you too about what, you know, what does, what, what misconceptions exist about the infrastructure that you work with um, in real time? I think complexity, people often, don't fully grasp just how complex the thing we deploy for them is and all of the moving parts that go into providing that experience for them. Um, yeah, misconceptions. <laughs> that Jupiter is a well put together organization sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, um, Jupiter Hub in particularly is 
um, entirely volunteer led as well. And we don't necessarily have the backing of an organization. So bringing in funds to do work and push forward feature development is really, really difficult. It requires a lot of person time to sit down and write that grant and to work it all out. And all of that is also volunteer labor as well. So that's quite precarious. And it means that your user base isn't always You know, um, like you might have to like work on things for things might be on the pipe, the laundry list for a really long time before they get done when it when it's so much easier to go to X Club provider and have regular updates because they've they've got all that infrastructure behind them in terms of money, person power, just pure resource to throw at a problem and churn it out on an appropriate time frame, for example. I think the issue of um, the issue of dealing with these developing countries in the rural and, and like specifically rural areas within those developing countries as well, I think it's a really important one and it's one that we have to balance really delicately and one where this idea the right to participate that two ITC are currently thinking about is going to be really important because we are drawing off a lot of movements such as nothing about us without us to deal to um to kind of like build that document and um because we from the global north can't just come in and be like we have the solutions we'll do it for you that's like really condescending and it's not going to actually help anybody long term either. So we have to be really thoughtful about building those trust relationships. And um, it's like knowledge sharing and training and um, and and everything that go and like that kind of that aspect of of the open source, open science ethos, whereas like we are not we are not gatekeeping here, but doing it in a really thoughtful way, I think as well. I think I feel like I kind of like went away from your question a little bit there. <laughs> of course. Um and I also am just directing it towards people in order to, you know, make it easier for folks to respond, but also feel free to respond to each other, of course. Um, I see that I think Lillian dropped off, but hopefully we'll be able to get her back in. Um, and then uh, maybe Richard, would you like to respond at all? Um, in, in terms of this, uh, well, I think it's interesting in the case of um, uh, something's been in the chat. I'm thinking maybe it's a little bit off the question, but this question of like when infrastructure gets invisible and like I'm talking about like say the 2I2C or the related Jupiter and Binder projects, right? It's that sense that, well, you've got corporations behind you and this must be going. Same thing I think with academic institutions, you look at archive uh, or something like MedArchive, BioArchive, it's like, they seem really good. Like, oh, you've got all the things. And I think that that speaks to the problems of transparency because on the one hand, it's very helpful when we talk about open infrastructure that it be seen as reliable and sustained that it's a thing that can really work um, and has some good polish to it. Um, but then the concern about the truth telling about some of the tech debt and some of the other things which every organization has, the unwillingness to show warts and some of that where the finances are a little tight um, becomes really problematic because you know if, if you're if, if you're not willing to kind of be transparent, I don't think you're really being open. Um, transparency does come with cost, but it's also opportunities when you can show that, you no, know, this is where our balance sheets really aren't, or, or PL or however you want to think about it, our budget is really stressed and strained, then we can get more resources to you. Then we can better understand how to support you um, and maybe come up with some solutions for more community support, say on the tech side or whatever else that you're dealing with and, and leverage, you know, mobilize more resources, shared resources, like Lillian was talking about to make this work. 
Um, but that sense of, no, I need to keep up a good face and I need to, to demonstrate that I'm good at what I do for people to trust me, um, that can be problematic. And, and I think negotiating that and dealing with that in, a, in this community is really important because at the end of the day, it's not insufficient just to say, oh, we're going to take this commercial for-profit solution and replace it with an open solution and that'll be fine. That'll work for us. When we talk about openness, it's a fundamentally different culture and a fundamentally different approach that needs to be more collaborative, cooperative, complementary uh, than you find in the for-profit sector. And I think that's how we build a vibrant infrastructure for or a vibrant ecosystem of open infrastructure services is making them work better, work better, share things more and be more honest and transparent and say like, hey, I'm kind of struggling with this and then have others kind of help, whether it's organizations like IOI um, or organizations like 2I2C that's really trying to help architect and bring things pieces together or whoever else is in the space kind of help out you know, and, and shore things up and make things more sustainable. That doesn't mean that we should allow bad actors, if there are any in the space, to continue doing bad things just because they're too big to fail. Um, but it does mean that we need to be able to support each other in meaningful ways to make this all work for, for all of us. Yeah, we're trying to come up with like a cost recovery model at 2I2C that both sustains us, but provides a pathway in for those who don't have as many resources to like cover the full cost of like how much it actually costs to run something in the cloud right cost can build up over a long time um and it's all very well and as good saying this is open infrastructure but if it's not accessible to everybody then who is it really certain right and and i think the key thing we miss because your people and that's where we get the, with the free and open source software. People think, oh, it should be free. And I, I think it's about removing barriers to participation as much as possible. Um, but the, the, the thing that sometimes gets lost is when you are financially contributing to a service, whether it's a, a fee or a donation or something like that, that is a type of ownership and engagement with the service um, that sometimes gets missed. And yeah, it's, it's it, you know, I, we don't want to, obviously we exclude anyone from participation and there's ways to get around that. But the cost recovery is important and, and, and finding viable ways of doing that. I posted some things in the chat about that, um, you know, some of the utility models and things like that that we're looking at for how to make things more sustainable. Um, but cost recovery is really important so that these can be sustainable. And there's lots of opportunities to be get very creative with it. Um, but sometimes that conversation doesn't even get started before there's some, and in some cases, very legitimate concerns. But we also need to be more thoughtful about, okay, how are we going to maintain these now and into the future? I maybe want to take a step back again. I feel like we go we go two steps forward and then we'll take a step back. We go two steps forward and we take a step back. Um, and maybe direct to Raya for a second um, in the sense that I think you both brought up some really important things um, that speak to implicitly, you know, who is legitimized and who is not legitimized. Um, and like who receives resources and who doesn't receive resources is really dependent upon that. And so I wonder if Ray and your experiences, not only with the incubator, but more broadly with Code for Science and Society, how do you think through this question of legitimation and like the distribution of resources. Um, Cause I think you were, well, we're talking about, you know, how do you build a cost recovery model? Definitely, but maybe we'll take it back even into the broader principles. What enables that in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, part of our job is to um, fight against those imbalances and inequities and we have to figure out the different ways that we're going to do that uh, something that we've been thinking about at CSNS is um, uh, how to think with uh, technologists about transferring power right um, building it and then transferring it within their communities how do we think about our social infrastructures as stable but as transient right so that we build something that someone else can take on and then my what i've done is really i don't need to do it anymore right i actually step back right <laughs> let someone else do it uh let someone else take the next chapter uh take the the helm for the next version um 
And that's something that like, I think across societies we're gonna to have to be thinking about. It's not unique to this technological space, um, but it's, uh, it's a place where we can start thinking about it. Um, so I think there. I'm sorry to be on and off video. I am different kind of infrastructure, care infrastructures are on pause over here. So I'm juggling a two-year-old. Thanks for your patience. If there's anything maybe this conversation is highlighting is that it's all infrastructure all the way down. And how in the world do we support these infrastructures all the way down with the limited resources and time, emotional support? How do we, how do we enable that in different ways that we do? Um, and I think this actually leads then into the next question, um, which is really about, you know, if we're talking about legitimation, if we're talking about trying to build structures that are sustainable, that take us into the future, that may or may not include us, right? Who are, could be transient actors within the space. Um, who has authority there? Um, whether you're on the strategic kind of broader level, or if you're also very much on the ground with folks. Um, I, and I hope we'll be able to uh, get Lillian back, um, but oh, she's okay during the storm. And yeah, I think with that question of authority, then, then maybe I'll pass it on to, to Sarah, um, who I know you were talking about uh, what it's like to work with institutions in real time on, on new techno-social systems. Yeah. Uh, in, it, who has the power uh, in influencing open infrastructure? It's it's a really tough one. Like I'd like to say everyone, and I think like everybody who's affected by that infrastructure, everybody who uses that infrastructure. I don't think we're there, we're there yet. We're a long way off. Um, it's a very lofty moonshot goal, which we absolutely should be shooting for. Um, one way is we try to, you know, distribute the power that we have into ITC is by taking feedback from the communities that we serve. What do you need? What can we build? And taking the input as we build. We want to take it further as well in terms of empowering them to build with us. So like, it doesn't just have to be a, we want, here. here's your design specifications. And then we go away and come back six months later and be like, here's the thing. Um, but yeah, when you're working with research and education groups, you end up with, um, you can, end up rubbing shoulders against like old institutions of power and you know working with IT services who want to very firmly control who has access um, and that makes it that causes a tension when you want to say actually it's their infrastructure I want to be able to give them access to do a thing um and yeah and that it like reinforces a, a power dynamic um and it can just be we we try and we try and fight for what we believe in but we also have to make compromises as well um to the point where we can't we're not within organizations to be able to disrupt this thinking and like maybe um you know there's like plenty of plenty of very valid very excellent reasons to control who has access to your infrastructure as well um so yeah it's about chipping away gaining an inch where we can it's not going to happen overnight my cat is very distressed that i've not fed him yet um, there's a breakdown in care infrastructure as well when uh, <laughs> um, yeah. only becomes visible when it doesn't work exactly not being fed. exactly <laughs> been ignoring me all day and now 15 minutes past dinner time and suddenly um, yeah 
<laughs> so yeah, I th I think it's a really difficult problem. Like ideally, we want everybody to have power and infrastructure um, that affects them, and then they use. But it's going to be a long journey. Well, to build on that, I mean, managing power and and influence in organizations is what governance is all about, and I think that's where it. We neglect governance to our own um, detriment in this when we don't think in intentionally about how we balance different interests and um, and values in this. And the the mere appearance of power isn't a problem. It's just how is power being managed? And so who has the influence? And so when we talk about community um, governance, allowing the centering governance in the community, which we're going to be having to make a plug, shameless plug, we're going to releasing a paper about next week. Um, uh, this is the opportunity then when it's well structured to balance those power interests in such a way that we can serve a community interest. It does require though that the community be engaged. It's insufficient to say like, well, you know, we appointed so-and-so to our board. Well, that person works 60 hour weeks and is, you know, it doesn't have the opportunity really to advocate for the interests that they've been asked to do um, and to balance those power imbalances and, and and, and do a role. So there's a role then for the sponsoring organizations, maybe to make extra time available to, to meaningfully support their engagement and 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 allow them to, to fulfill that role and that expectation. Um, it's complicated things. And for people who are running these organizations that are really just trying to make payroll or trying to just like make sure the service has a, a good uptime and everything else, it can seem really daunting. And that's where I think making that road easier. So good governance, a minimum viable governance structure can be put in place. They have the tools to think meaningfully about how they want to structure their governance. Um, but at fundamentally, um, hopefully having that intention to be open and then showing them what that looks like so that the question isn't, um, well, should this be open? The question is, why shouldn't this be open? So we kind of flip the culture there. And I think that's where we're chipping away. We eventually reach that point where it's that open by default kind of takes hold. And that's where we how we start looking at things. Um, that's definitely what I would like to see uh, in the work that that is done and in, in this space. Yeah, I don't necessarily, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think it's like really hard when some people who hold power don't acknowledge the existence of the community because, you know, from the grant making perspective, they, they don't exist, right? Um, like so yeah it's like <laughs> if you want all the fancy money you attach yourself to a university but then like your community is just like a a group of people that gathers on the internet because they have a shared um a, a shared common interest and they may not necessarily belong to that university so why why should why should they have access when they, yeah. I, don't, I think there's like way more complicated factors as well. And it's really difficult. But it's getting increasingly hard, I think, to maintain that kind of, like you said, that that ignorance of community and the impact of community or awareness, whether intentional or not, like it's getting harder and harder. And I think the job of advocates in the space is to make it harder. You know, we, it's harder to talk about governance structures that don't empower the community when there are clear examples and a community that why aren't you doing this like it becomes a lot harder than to to maintain the status quo um so that is that's the hope that i see in this effort is really kind of creating a an alternative a meaningful viable alternative just the same with open open infrastructure a viable alternative people can see themselves in it and they want to become a part of it and they become they help build it I think I, I want to push back here, maybe before passing the mic on to, to Rhea, in the sense that I think you, you both brought up some really important points. Um, but again, in the same way that we've tried bit by bit to unpack infrastructure and open infrastructure, um, when we say things like community led, or when we say things like, um, you know, who has authority, the question that's always kind of come out of that has been, you know, what are the boundaries of the community? If something is for everyone, if something is for the community, what, what are those boundaries? Um, in the sense that is open infrastructure for the folks that have put in the labor, the sweat, the time to build 
the tools, the systems, the practices that we use? Um, or is it the, the kind of loftier goal that put us all into this research space of like contributing to, to knowledge for the public? Um, right, this like goal that has kind of been subsumed in all of the things and the systems that make that work possible. And so when I think about who's, who are we accountable to, um, it feels like there are, are layers to that. There's the community of folks who have built those tools that we are accountable to empowering and platforming um, and giving lending visibility. But then there's also, you know, the public that as we've seen during this call, Lillian dropped a really important point and then disconnected, right? In the sense that we're not only accountable to, yes, the folks that build this infrastructure that we're talking through, that legitimizes some, doesn't legitimize others, that require resources across the board. But at the same time, you know, we have publics that are affected by whatever is being made in our respective spaces, what we're, we're on the ground or, or developing strategy. And so, yeah, I, I think the question of authority in many ways is divided between who doesn't have authority, but should be kept in mind in the whole process, which is actually that loftier goal, the, the public, right, contributing to public knowledge. Um, and to answer that question, I think it's, we, there is no, well, one size or one model fits all for community or definition of community. It's for each organization. They, have, they need to have the autonomy to define their community. The 2I2C community is very different from the IOI community. Uh, there's overlap in there, and that's great. But it really, um, each organization needs to define that community for themselves. But it need, that definition needs to follow a certain set of guidelines. You know, it's like, oh, we're just going to serve the people in the U.S. or Europe or something like that. I mean, not when you're a global service, unless there's some really compelling reason and you manifest that very intentionally and you say, this is the reason why we're only focusing on researchers in, in Europe and for the service that we're providing. And here's our reasoning for it. Again, to be part of the open infrastructure to represent our values where we want diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you're making this decision, you need to be transparent about it, you know, and allow the community, those that are watching to make, to evaluate that and decide whether they want to support your service. Um, it's just I think manifesting more intentionality around these decisions is, is very important. Why are you choosing this financial model? Why are you having this governance model? Why did you incorporate in this jurisdiction? Manifesting that is, is a very important signal to the community, to, to everyone out there about who you are and what you are as an organization. Um, so I think there's kind of setting the, the broad outlines, like and like you said, around like community and who's empowered and, and things like that. Um, and and structuring that conversation so it's clear that these are kind of how we have these conversations and we need to have it but then allowing the service providers themselves in this space to then articulate okay this is why we've made this decision or that decision or, or whatever else and i think at that point then evaluating that on their merits and say like oh yeah, that's a compelling reason or mm, you might think about this and everything else i think that's how we negotiate these power imbalances and, and work this out i'm not certain what the alternative is if we're not talking kind of on some kind of common, you know, basis about shared values and, and coming together in conversation. I'm not sure what the alternative is for how we work out these tensions and these concerns and these issues uh, to achieve what we want to. And I think that actually, maybe Ray, I could pass it on to you of one, if you have a response in this direction, but also, we were trying to end um, today's session. I can't believe it's already, we're almost six minutes to time. Um, on a perhaps more hopeful question, we talked a lot through all of these definitions, but also to ask, you know, what is needed to sustain um, open infrastructure in the million different ways in which we've talked about it um, today. Right, Ray, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, I mean, I think accountability, which is, um what Richard was going to, but I think I would take it slightly different uh, tack to it. I mean, we need accountability to stay, sustain open infrastructure, but that also means changing the mindset from thinking about the provider of services to the consumer of services. I mean, those, we should stop seeing those distinctions, right? If it's, if something is actually a community led, designed, built and owned tool, then that distinction of like provider and consumer 
become something of the past. And what we have then is is a community a community tool, right? Um, we're far away from that, but I don't think it's uh, beyond the the horizons that we can work towards. I'd love to hear if there are questions from the audience before we close. And I've been trying to comb through the chat, seeing if there are questions coming up. I think there were some very provocative ones asked earlier um, from Angela, who said, uh, I'll maybe read out her comment. Um, she says, I worry a little about, about the label of critical infrastructure. Who does it serve to distinguish between what is critical and what is not and who decides? Um, and she says, what other models are being are possible or being tested? And I'll bring this question back to the bottom here. I'll just like, because I, I did answer, I tried to answer her comments in the chat. Um, I completely, I don't think the gatekeeping is a, an advantageous thing, but I do think that there needs to be some conversation around it and, and it should be a very broad, inclusive conversation. It takes in a lot of interest. Uh, and in terms of the model, we've kind of been discussing a little bit about the um, the public understanding is a public good and how we finance other public goods, particularly utilities um, in the space. That's some of the things that we're exploring and we'll hopefully, fingers crossed, have out soon <laughs> some of our work. Um, thinking about this, you know, the, the analog of how we make sure the water runs and the power's on and all that kind of stuff. Because um, it it's very, uh, very relevant to this conversation as well. I think in your work, Sarah, where, how would you interpret this question? of what is and what is not critical. <laughs> I think it's our support channel. That when something breaks and we get panicked emails, <laughs> I think that's what I'm telling us um, what's critical or, or um, what's not. And that's coming from, from the community. That's like, um, we really need X to be able to do our job or like our hub is down. Like, that's a major criticality, right? And uh, but um, on on the on like the topic of we need X to do Y. That's going to vary from community to community because these are not all the same communities doing all the same things. We've got um, you know climate groups to neuroscience groups to I don't even know what else. Um, to be honest, um, we just. I, and I, I think one place that we need to improve is that sort of um, translation layer of what a user request is into an engineering feature. I think that's like one thing that um, we need to build out at the minute. Um, because like one beauty of in infrastructure is that if it works well, no one knows what it's doing and they don't need to, right? They don't like people doing research with Jupyter notebooks in the cloud don't need to know how Kubernetes runs, but it's a major problem when Kubernetes breaks. Um, so we need like a translation layer of, I wanna do X with Y and how, so how does that look to implement kind of thing? So, and like, and that and that's a critical thing to that community. Otherwise they won't be able to do their research or they won't be able to teach the thing they want to teach. Um, so yeah, I think that's like one thing, one, one way that we deal with that. Um, there's probably others that I am less aware of because I'm like very much in the engineering part of the, of the organization. And there's probably like, if we had Jim Colliander on the call, he could probably be like, here's some critical infrastructure regarding like leads and partnerships and, and everything. It really begs the question of, you know, if I were to take, take the line of something that Reid says about, you know, how do we get beyond these binaries between provider and consumer or, or other binaries, right? Between, you know, 
community led or not uh, or top top down bottoms up you know these binaries that you know define a lot of the work that we do in order to be able to you know move forward or take steps to to improve these systems um when it's embedded in the process of being an engineer like turning a user request for these very ambiguous needs right where i think i saw a tweet the other day that said people don't say what they mean don't do what they say and so how do you build something that um is never explicitly talked about slash is building sometimes what we really need in the first place um and i know that we are at the end of time um i just wanted to thank you all for joining um this morning afternoon evening from all the spots of the world that you come from um Thank you so much to Lillian, who also joined us. And just to let you all know, uh, following the cues of Gilbert Bayemba from Policy, um, they suggested that we leave the Zoom room open um, after every event that they, they do. Um, in case anyone has any additional questions or, or comments or suggestions, there's no pressure for anyone in order to stay, but it's saying that there's not necessarily a mic drop. Um, thanks you all so much for joining and thank you so much for your insights.